Let's open our Bibles to the book of Revelation. We're in chapter 19. We're going to be looking at verses 1 through 10. As mentioned, in a, we had so many announcements today. Um, it's quite a, quite a few things the Lord is doing in our midst, and um, I invite you to be part of those things, you know, to, if you're a young adult, to be in the young adult study, if you're able to come to the men's study on, on uh, Tuesday mornings, and uh, Wednesday night we're going through the book of Job. There's so many things that we would invite you to be part of, and if you've never been to Israel, we'd love to have you go with us. If you're able to, we'd love to have you with us. We're, I'm going to hopefully firm up the dates. It, as mentioned, it's probably the last week of March into the first week of April. Uh, we're firming up the price on that too. And uh, we've got quite a number of people who have shown interest. And I really do believe that that we will be able to have, uh, unless unless the Lord would choose otherwise, We'll, we'll be able to go to Israel, God willing, next, uh, next uh, year. And um, we have several churches that have joined with us who want to go with us, uh, including Brennan uh, in uh, Brennan Beeler's fellowship, Holland Davis's fellowship, a friend of mine named David Maestas, who's the pastor of uh, Calvary in Los Lunas, uh, New Mexico, and, um, and others. And Mike Riccioli, I think, is wanting to go with us from Ontario. And so anyway, if you've never been to Israel or if you've gone and would like to go again, obviously we'd love to have you with us. It's one of those things that uh, Pastor Chuck used to say, that a trip to Israel was like a year in a seminary. Uh, you, get, you get such a, a great uh, feel of the Bible and all. We'd love to have you go with us. Well, today we're in Revelation 19. We're going to look at verses 1 through 10 as we continue. I had mentioned last week that we were going to look at the second coming and it turns out I'm a false prophet. Please, nobody throw any rocks at me. But uh, I, 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 was, I was working on this study, and I, and I knew I'm not going to be able to do that. So we're going to go 1 to 10, verses 1 through 10, and we're going to see how heaven rejoices, and you'll see why as we go through this passage. So we'll begin, we'll begin here in chapter 19 at verse 1. We'll read verses 1 through 3, and I'll give you some background in order for you to get a grasp of what is taking place. There's going to be a reason why I need to give a background here, and you'll see it in just a moment. So beginning at verse 1, reading to verse 3, Revelation chapter 19. After these things, I heard a loud voice of a great multitude in heaven saying, Alleluia, salvation and glory and honor and power belong to the Lord our God, for true and righteous are his judgments. Because he has judged the great harlot who corrupted the earth with her fornication. And he has avenged on her the blood of his servants shed by her. Again, they said, Alleluia. Her smoke rises up forever and ever. So what we see here is a word of praise. Alleluia means uh, praise the Lord. We'll look at that in just a moment. But it's a word of praise. And he's speaking about a loud voice of a great multitude in heaven. And these voices are lifting up praise to God. As Christians, we of all people are to be quick to give God praise and gratitude. And we do give him praise and gratitude because of all that he has done for us, for his goodness that he has shown towards us. And we also praise God because, believe it or not, he has commanded us to do so. In his word, we are commanded to give him praise. Psalm 150, verse 6 let everything that has breath praise the Lord. The Bible actually commands us to give him praise. And so we do. We praise him because we love him. We praise him because we love his word and we desire to keep his word. We praise him for so many reasons. One is we praise him because he's given us access to himself. He has done so through Jesus Christ. Without Christ, you have a, no access to God. But Jesus Christ came so that I might have a relationship with him and access to him. Jesus made it very clear. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. So we have access to God. And because I can come to God and I can bring my praise to him, I can bring my petitions to him, my concerns to him, I can come to him and I do so through Jesus Christ. Well, obviously, because his word commands me to and because he is worthy, I praise him. I have a, a relationship with God because of Jesus Christ who made it possible. 
In the book of Hebrews, in chapter 10, verse 19, that verse tells us that we can have boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus Christ. And so we have access to God. And even as the psalmist in Psalm 95, verses 1 and 2 said, he said, Oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs and praise. Let us come to him. Let us praise him. Let us make a joyful noise to him. Now, when you read the words joyful noise, you may wonder what that means. I did. First time I ever went to Israel was in 1983, and I went with my pastor, Chuck Smith, and several others, and we were at the Western Wall. It's been called the Wailing Wall, but the Western Wall there in uh, Jerusalem. And as we were there, there were people having a bar mitzvah, and there were there were women who were, were uh, raising their voices, making a loud noise and, and all. And, and I asked my pastor, I said, why are they doing that? Why are they raising their voices that way? And he says, because the Bible says, make a joyful noise unto the Lord. And that's what they're doing. This is the sound of joy. And so we've seen that firsthand. We've been there. And the scripture says that we're to enter his courts with praise. We make a, a, a joyful noise unto the Lord. So as believers, we give praise to God because he has blessed us. We have entrance into his courts. We come with singing and praise, and, and he has blessed us. Like it says in Psalm 103, verse 2, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. When it says, and forget not all his benefits, the word benefit speaks of his blessings. Don't forget how God has blessed you. The psalmist in Psalm 22, verse 26, said it like this. He said, the afflicted shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him shall praise the Lord. And he goes on to say, may your hearts live forever. When he says that the afflicted shall eat and be satisfied, we thank God for his blessings. We thank God for his provisions. We also give praise to God because of his goodness and his mercy, that goodness and mercy that he's shown to us. Psalm 106 verse 1 says, praise the Lord. Give thanks to God, to the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. So we give God praise. We're commanded to. He's blessed us. He's provided for us. He's made it uh, wonderful for us to live and have relationship with him. And so there are so many reasons in scripture that are given to give praise to God. But in this verse, in this passage, it's interesting because we give praise to God because he has judged the wicked. The judgment of the unrighteous is something that Truly righteous, and I'm going to develop this with you, the judgment of the unrighteous is something that the truly righteous actually rejoice in. And it isn't a self-righteous desire for people to get what they deserve. You know, you're sitting at a stop sign, and somebody blows past and goes right through the stop sign. And a cop pulls them over, and you say, yeah, he got what he deserved. No, it's not that kind of, it's not that kind of rejoicing. No, they got what they deserve. No, it's actually a holy desire for our good and loving God to be vindicated. The truly righteous long for a better world where holiness and righteousness rules. A, a person who loves the Lord longs for a, a world where God is reverenced and, and his love and his mercy flows. And so this person who desires to see God move and be glorified and and to be revered and all. Well, when they see the world in such pain and so morally polluted, it actually breaks their heart and they begin to mourn. When they see the evil, it does something to you. It bothers you. You actually mourn over the evil of this world. That's what that, that moved the heart of a man by the name of Lot. When you read your Bible, the, the man Lot was actually Abraham's nephew. And Abraham and, and Lot, their, their, their herds had grown so much that there began to be a, a bit of, a, of a, a problem between the herdsmen. And so, so much so that they, they couldn't uh, live together anymore, if you will. They had to depart. They had to, they had to separate. And so they stood looking over this, this particular area. And Abraham said to his, his nephew, and this was really, really generous of Abraham. He didn't have to do this. But he looked at his nephew and he says, if you, you go to the right, I'll go to the left. If, if you want to go to the left, I'll go to the right. You need to choose. And so Lot looks and he sees Sodom and Gomorrah. He sees that, that area and it's so beautiful and everything. Well, he decides to, to go and he live in, live in a place called Sodom. 
Now, in Genesis 13, verse 13, that verse says that the men of Sodom were exceedingly wicked and sinful against the Lord. But Lot chose to live in sinful Sodom because the area was so beautiful. But over time, he grew very grieved over the decadence and the evil of that city. Now, we all know of one of those sins that caused God to judge Sodom and Gomorrah. But Ezekiel gave us other sins to be aware of. And in the Old Testament book of Ezekiel 16, verses 49 and 50, this is what he wrote. He said, this was the sin of your sister Sodom. She and her daughters, the daughters were the smaller cities around uh, Adma, Zeboim, and Zoar. Uh, Genesis 14, 8 gives the names. She and her daughters were arrogant, overfed, unconcerned. They did not help the poor and needy. They were haughty and did detestable things before me. Therefore, I did away with them as you have seen. So Sodom actually became, and Gomorrah and the sister cities became uh, Proverbs. It became, they became pictures of God's judgment on evil. Well, Lot was living there in Sodom, but as he was living there in Sodom, his heart was grieved by what he saw every day. He was finally delivered from the city and its evil. The Bible in 2 Peter 2, verses 7 and 8, gives us insight. It says, at the same time, God rescued Lot out of Sodom because he was a good man who was sick of all the immorality and wickedness around him. Yes, he was a righteous man. Now notice, who was distressed by the wickedness he saw and heard day after day. A truly righteous person gets distressed over the evil. They don't get used to it, and they don't make excuses for it. You get distressed by it, and you pray that God would save those people, of course, but also deliver us. You see, believers live in the world, but the world is not to live in the believer. So when you see and you hear so much blasphemy towards God, your heart becomes grieved over this. And it's not a self-righteous desire for vengeance. Again, it's a desire for the name of God to be vindicated. God has brought judgment on wicked Babylon. The saints are to rejoice. Now, in Revelation 6, 9, and 10, the tribulation saints that had been martyred had cried out for justice. We saw that when we went through chapter 6. And they had asked God, how long? How long will it be until you judge those who have harmed us? When are you going to avenge our blood against these people? Well, that time has come. Again, some say heaven's rejoicing over judgment of wicked. Well, that seems cruel. But these people had had the greatest opportunity to repent in history. Think about it. We've been going through the book of Revelation, and these are people, and it's a seven-year period, and these are people who had survived these judgments. They had survived the seal judgments. They had survived the trumpet judgments, even the bowl judgments, these terrible judgments. And as this was happening, they've heard the gospel preached. They heard it from the 144,000, the two witnesses, the angel. They've heard it. Many of them have heard it from those who had been converted and to come to faith in Christ. They've been listening and hearing that gospel. They've seen judgment as it's been poured out. In, Revel in Revelation chapter 6, verses 7 and 8, uh, that revealed that the fourth seal judgment had, had fallen and one quarter of the population had died and if you were to look at the population as it is today, that would mean about 1.9 or 2 billion people had died in that particular um, uh, judgment. Chapter 9, verse 15, revealed the sixth trumpet judgment, and one-third of the people died. That's another 2 billion people. Half of the world has been judged. Half of the Earth's population has died. And, and think of it again. Think about what we've seen from chapter 6 to 18. They've experienced famine. Pestilence, earthquakes, polluted oceans, hail and fire, meteors, polluted drinking water, demonic activity. They've, they've seen war, sores on their own bodies, darkness, scorching heat. They saw Babylon destroyed. And they've been given so many opportunities to come to faith in the most trying of times, but they refuse to change. The Bible says something in Hebrews 4, verse 7, where it says again, he designates a certain day, saying in David, today, after such a long time as it has been said, today, 
if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Do not harden your hearts. So many people hear the gospel and, and they willfully harden and reject what they're hearing. And God says, look, I love you, but I'm righteous, God would say in his word, and I'm bringing judgment. Don't harden your heart. Come to faith in me. But they refuse to. These people have gone through, in chapters 6 through 18, hell on earth. They've seen so much. But the oceans, the creatures in the oceans had died. The smell of pollution of the dead and rotting corpses. Their own drinking water had been turned to blood. They've gone through so many things, and yet they refuse. They hardened their hearts. But like when the door was closed on the ark, well, the door of opportunity has now closed on them. So the rejoicing is not simply because they're happy that God judges stiff-necked sinners. It's because Jesus gets the glory as he has crowned earth's true kings. It's like when, it's like when the 24 elders in Revelation 11, verse 17 said, We give you thanks, O Lord God Almighty, the one who is and who was and who is to come because you have taken your great power and reigned. And they look at over the earth, how it's been destroyed. Everything has been so messed up. John MacArthur said something. He said, I've told environmentalists that if they think humanity's wrecking the planet, wait until they see what Jesus does to it. I think that's a good point. Well, chapter 19 picks up where chapter 16 had concluded with the seventh bowl judgment. And John now returns to what occurs at the end of the bowl judgments. Now, remember, in Matthew 24, verses 21 and 22, Jesus said that the tribulation would be a time of incredible pressure and pain. He said, for then there will be great tribulation, such as not, has not been since the beginning of the world until this time. No, nor ever shall be. And unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. So as we've gone through chapters 6 through 18 of Revelation, we've come to see what he was saying. J. J. Vernon McGee, many people know of his name. J. Vernon was on every radio station in the world, I think. J. Vernon, and he said, Revelation 19 marks a dramatic change in the tone of Revelation. The destruction of Babylon, the capital of the beast kingdom, marks the end of the great tribulation. The somber gives way to song. The transfer is from darkness to light, from black to white, from dreary days of judgment to bright days of blessing. This chapter makes a definite distinction in Revelation and ushers in the greatest event for this earth, the second coming of Christ. It is the bridge between the great tribulation and the millennium. So when commercial Babylon was destroyed, we saw how the world cried out in despair and sorrow. We saw that there was a response of the kings of the earth, the merchants who were standing at a distance for fear of her torment, how they were weeping, and even the shipmasters and sailors, how they cried out, they mourned, they wept, and they wailed, and they saw the destruction. Well, chapter 19 begins with the response given to the invitation that had been recorded in chapter 18, verse 20, where it says, Rejoice over her, O heaven, and you holy apostles and prophets, for God has avenged you on her. Rejoice, he says. Rejoice, heaven. Rejoice, apostles. Rejoice, prophets. God has avenged you. And so that's what we pick up here in chapter 19. And so verse 1, after these things, John writes, I heard a loud voice of a great multitude in heaven saying, Alleluia, salvation and glory and honor and power belong to the Lord our God. John begins by saying, after these things. When he says, after these things, that's marking a new vision. He's given us a new insight. And he says, notice in verse 1, he said, I heard a loud voice of a great multitude in heaven saying, Alleluia. So this response follows the destruction of Babylon in all its forms. As the people of the world are wailing, crying, 
Heaven explodes in united praise to God. At first, the loud cries of Alleluia are coming from angels in heaven. Millions of angels are crying out in worship and praise to the Lord. And the angelic choir bursts out in praise. They cry out Alleluia. They cry out salvation, speaking of deliverance. They cry out glory, referring to God's moral glory in judgment. They, they cry out honor, referring to what he deserves, and, and power, referring to what he displayed in judging Babylon. So it begins with the angels, but we'll get to verse 5, and that will include the redeemed. They also will join in the praise. Now notice again in verse 1, they cry out, Alleluia. Alleluia is the Greek translation of the Hebrew word, Hallelujah. Hallelujah simply literally translates, praise the Lord. So Alleluia that word alleluia is used four times in the New Testament. All four times are in this chapter. It's a picture of what is called uninhibited praise. It's interesting how one commentator pointed out that the word hallelujah, which we're all very familiar with, how the word hallelujah is first found in Psalm 104. And when it was first used, praise the Lord, it's expressed when the enemies of God no longer exist. In Psalm 104, verse 35, it says, May sinners vanish from the earth, and the wicked be no more. Then he goes on to say, Praise the Lord, my soul. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah, that the enemies of God no longer exist. Well, it's interesting that in Revelation, it's used when God's enemies are judged. Heaven rejoices because God's power to save has been openly displayed. Now, there had been a question asked by those who had been martyred for their faith. We saw it in Revelation 6, verse 10, how they called out in a loud voice, How long, sovereign Lord, holy and true, until you judge the inhabitants of the earth and avenge our blood? Well, here their question has been answered. He avenged them on Babylon. In verse 2, For true and righteous are his judgments. He's judged the great harlot. Ba Babylon's judgment has been declared to be true and righteous. He has judged this, this system that was established by, by Satan and Antichrist, and he's a, avenged the blood of those who have been martyred. You see, ever since the, the birth of the church, believers have undergone injustice in the world. There have been many times of unfair treatment. The church longs for justice. The time of God's justice has arrived. It says, to him belongs proper vengeance because he's the one who judges righteously. In Psalm 19, verse 9, it says, the fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. Justice is always paired with righteousness. Never forget that. True justice is righteous justice. And it says in verse 2, he has judged the great harlot who corrupted the earth with a fornication. Again, the great harlot is Satan's and Antichrist system that polluted the world. The evil polluted everything it touched and is right that it's been thrown down. Pollution can corrupt everything it touches. A, a while back now, to illustrate how pollution can corrupt, um, our, our plumbing in our house went bad right around the, the first of the year. Marie and I had, we had, dealt with um, that COVID, and we had it for a while. And, and, and now all of our plumbing backed up. We went into the, the bathroom, and, and the, the septic had come out of the, um, the, wa the, the uh, shower and overflowed in the bathroom, and, and it flooded the whole, well, a, a third of the bottom floor there, up everything. And, went into the laundry room, and, and so I thought, you know, well, we'll just clean this up. I wasn't thinking about it, but he did it again. So there you are, you know, there you are, Marie, clean that up. I got things to do. No, um, <laughs> so there we are mopping it up and cleaning it up and everything, and, and finally my son Joseph and his wife Karina and our baby Olive are living with us as they're looking for a home. They sold their home, and they're living with us right now. And, and so, long story made short, you know, Joseph says, I think that perhaps um, perhaps the, uh, your insurance may cover this. I thought maybe. 
Well, I'll be honest with you, I could go on for this long time. It took months for everything to finally be settled and, and everything. I mean, a, a bedroom was flooded, the laundry room was flooded, the hallway was flooded, the bathroom was flooded, shower was flooded. Then, then we had the inspector come in, and anywhere that water hit, it was now infected. So we had to remove everything, everything, cabinets, Every, everything that that water hit, we had to redo a, full, a whole floor, redo the floor in, a, in this small bedroom that's been made into a playroom for our grandkids. Everything was touched by that. The septic polluted. And that's kind of like what happens with the Antichrist in his religion, with his faith that he is presenting. It just pours out and infects everything that has been hit. It needs to be all cleaned out. It has to be all dealt with. And so this judgment is coming because everything that this religion, this evil had touched, polluted it. And it's right that it's been thrown down. In verse 3, again, they said, Alleluia, her smoke rises up forever and ever. Notice it says her smoke rises up forever and ever. So that cannot speak of literal smoke because um, it doesn't rise forever. So it speaks of judgment. It speaks of the judgment that has been brought upon her because that judgment lasts forever. Matthew 25, 46, Jesus said, these will go away into eternal punishment, the righteous into eternal life. It lasts forever. So it's speaking of a, a lasting punishment and judgment. In verse 4, it says, the 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshiped God, who sat on the throne saying, amen, alleluia. 24 elders, four living creatures. We were introduced to them in chapter 4, the elders, as, as well as the four living creatures. And it speaks of them falling down before God in worship. Why do they do that? They do that because that's the proper response to worship of an incredible God. In Nehemiah chapter 9, verse 6, we read, You alone are the Lord. You have made the heavens, the heaven of heavens, with all their host, the earth, and all that is on it, the seas, and all that is in them. You give life to all of them, and the heavenly host bows down before you. So the elders represent the church, and the four living creatures are high-ranking angels. And so as this is taking place, verse 5, then a voice came from the throne saying, Praise our God, all you his servants, and, and those who fear him, both small and great. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude as the sound of many waters and as the sound of mighty thunderings saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigns. So the voice is unidentified, more than likely an angel, but a command is given, praise God, all you his servants, all you his servants. I want to talk about that for just a moment. That's a common way of speaking of Christians. That's because we are first and foremost God's servants. We're God's children. But we must also realize that we've been saved to serve. And the understanding that we've been bought at a price is intended to bring humility to us. And as a result of this understanding, we get to see ourselves as those who have been blessed by God to be saved and called by God to serve him always. I think that in today's church, we need to be reminded of that. And in first service, I shared a few things. I didn't prepare these in my notes, so these spontaneous thoughts that came, and I'll share some of them with you right now. You know, we live in a time when there are very few heroes, and when you look out and you see who are being raised up as heroes or those to be emulated, many times they're not people of moral character. They're not people that, that are actually called good or even righteous. They're, they're not. These, these are people very often who may be very outstanding at the, at the craft that they, that they practice. They may be wonderful athletes or they may be somebody very powerful with a lot of money. These are people that very often are used as the examples of, of heroic figures that we should emulate. And and, and I see that, but they're not necessarily people that uh, you as a Christian would say, I want to be like that. You see, because 
the heroic reality of a person is, is not the things that they do in terms of how they act in the sense of, I, I do these certain things and this has made me this. No, it's something that's deeper than that. It's something from the heart. And what you, what you see, as I see, as something heroic or a person that I can emulate, somebody that I want to be like, is going to be somebody who has character, somebody that I, I can respect as a person who, who is, is a good person. But that's not necessarily what we have today. And when you look at the world, there are quite a number of people that are raised up and used as, as, as heroic figures, people to emulate and all of that. So what happens in the church? Well, the church begins to wonder, who, who can I look to as a model? Who can I look to as somebody that, that I, I respect and admire and might even, might even want to emulate in the way that I live? And, and, and sometimes that can become a religious figure. It can become a pastor. It can become a well-known pastor. Well, what happens sometimes with a well-known pastor who have begun as a servant, and that's what made his fellowship grow, and that's what made him someone that people admired. Well, sometimes what happens is they begin to, to bask in the adulation. They begin to bask in the attention that they're given and begin to actually believe the things that are being said of them. And at one time they had been known for humility, but that can give way to arrogance and pride. And what happens is we can undermine that pastor by giving him so much attention and speaking so highly of him, uh, not only to others, but to him, that he begins to believe his own press. And that's a very dangerous place. Listen, you don't need a heroic pastor. You already have one. His name is Jesus. And he's the one you're supposed to look to. He's the one you're supposed to look to. And the church, the church sometimes forgets that. I, I see that in, 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 um, in our society quite often. Now, the person who never fails, the person who is always victorious, the person that I'm supposed to follow is Jesus Christ. And, and what I, as a pastor, am called by God to be is not the one who lords it over the flock, but I've been called by God to model servanthood, to be somebody who serves the Lord. We think of the, the Apostle Paul. And you, you read the Bible, ha almost half of the uh, New Testament was written by that man. And he was a man unequaled in ministry. As you read your Bible, you see that Paul traveled the known world. He shared the gospel. He brought many to faith in Christ. To this day, we read his writings, and many come to faith through his words that have been jotted down. Ultimately, he went to Rome. And while in Rome, we know that he was martyred. Now, his ambition was to take the gospel to where no one had heard the name of Jesus Christ. In Romans 15, verse 20, Paul said, I have made it my aim to preach the gospel, not where Christ was named, lest I should build on another man's foundation. I want to go out and take the word to where people haven't heard the name of Christ. Well, what made him great? One of the things that made him a great man is he didn't consider himself to be a great man. He said in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 9, a letter that he wrote, he said, I am the least of all the apostles. I'm not worthy to be called an apostle after the way I persecuted the church of God. In 1 Corinthians 9, verse 19, he said, Though I am free from all men, I've made myself a servant to all that I might win the more. And so the greatest in the kingdom, Jesus said, is the servant of all. And Jesus is the greatest in the kingdom. Therefore, we, we follow him. Paul said, follow me insofar as I follow Christ. And so a command is given to all servants to praise God. And at this command, praise to God rises from all in heaven. The angels, the Old Testament saints, raptured saints, tribulation saints are all included. It says in verse 6, it says, as I... I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, the sound of many waters. This, this mighty thundering gives understanding of mighty praise. The worship and glory that was given to God rises in volume, praising God for what he's done. He's the Lord God. Notice it says the Lord God omnipotent, and he reigns. Omnipotent means he has all power. In Jeremiah 10, 12, God used his power to make the earth. His wisdom set the world in place. His understanding spread out the heavens. So we give him glory because he reigns. And then it says in verse 7, let us be glad 
and rejoice. Give him glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come. His wife has made herself ready. His wife has made himself, herself ready. Hmm. Let me share with you a few things about this for a moment. Uh, there's something that has been lost on many in our generation, and that is the importance of marriage. It's been lost on many. Marriage is, for many, it's just an afterthought. It's not even a necessity. Marriage doesn't matter to many people. They think, well, why, why do I need to get married? I can live with someone. I have babies with that. We're a family, and we've redefined what marriage is. We've redefined what family is. This society has done that. And I think that the value of marriage has been lost on many, and the symbolism of what marriage represents, which is Christ and his bride, is not known by the world. One of the things, and I'm going to share a few thoughts with you about this, in the ancient biblical times, one of the things we need to know is that marriage was the greatest social event that was celebrated. The greatest social event that was celebrated in Israel. Wedding preparations and celebrations were elaborate. They normally had at least three aspects, if you will, elements. There was what was called the betrothal or the engagement, which was normally arranged by parents. Uh, this betrothal, when you read in Scripture, uh, the betrothal, well, the betrothal was a legally binding contract. It had a dowry, and the betrothal could only be broken by divorce. The people who were betrothed or engaged were regarded as married, and so it could only be broken by divorce. That's why Joseph would marry his espoused wife, his betrothed wife, had come, and it turns out she was pregnant. That's why the Bible tells us that he was considering divorce, because though they had not consummated, though they had not been married in the more literal sense, that I'll, I'll show you that in this moment, um, the only way to end that arrangement would have been a divorce. And so often this, this contract, the betrothal, would be signed before the children had reached marriageable age. Here's another thing that many of us in our, in our day don't, don't realize, is that uh, marriageable age uh, during the time of, of Christ was 13 or 14 years of age. When you think of uh, Mary, some people think of Mary as a young woman who would have been 18, 21, whatever, no. Mary was more than likely between the ages of 13, 15, maybe 16, when she became pregnant with Messiah. She wasn't an older woman or an older young lady. She was a young lady because they would get engaged and, and married uh, very often when they were 13 or 14 years of age. And so one of the things that they did is they had what is called the engagement or the betrothal. It was arranged by parents. It was legally binding. And they had a dowry, a bride price, it was called, and it could only be broken by divorce. But there was another, and that was another part, which was what is called the escort or the presentation. And that was the time of, of, of celebration before the actual ceremony. And then you'd have what was called the, the uh, celebration. And that's when the groom and his attendants came for the bride. They would then take her to, uh, her and her uh, bridesmaids to, to the ceremony, and uh, they'd have what is called the, the marriage supper. And that's when the bride is brought to the great festive meal. At the end of the feast was a final meal, and the groom would take the bride and consummate their marriage. So this symbolism, I want to develop it with you for a moment, is fulfilled in the church. The betrothal, uh, when the contract and dowry is decided, we have that the bride price, the redemption price, was decided. It's the blood of Christ. Redemption, the bride price, was Jesus' blood. In 2 Corinthians 11, 2 and 3, Paul said, I'm jealous for you with a godly jealousy. I promised you to one husband, to Christ, so that I might present you as a pure virgin to him. But I'm afraid that just as Eve was deceived by the serpent's cunning, your minds may somehow be led astray from your sincere and pure devotion to Christ. The betrothal is redemption. The escort is the rapture. And then the bridegroom comes for the bride. In Matthew, rather in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16 and 17, 
it says, the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet call of God. The dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and left behind will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the, the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. So there's a time between when the contract has been drawn and then the groom comes for the bride. And in that time, the groom would have been preparing, usually in his father's property, a place of dwelling for them. That's what Jesus said in John 14, 2 and 3, when he said, in my father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. For I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. So during this, this betrothal thing, and you know, when the contract was being signed and all, the, there would be a cup of, uh, of wine, a cup that would be uh, shared to make the covenant, which we see as a picture of communion. But the, but the groom would stand up, and he would give a speech. And this, what Jesus said is basically the template. It's the, it's the speech that, that Jewish grooms during his day would have said at the betrothal because Jesus stood up and said it. And that's what the young man would say when he was uh, settled on, on getting married to the young woman. He would stand up and he would say that. He would say, I, I go to prepare a place for you. And uh, if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and I will receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. That was a, a, a prayer that, or a statement that they would make during that time. Jesus just gave it to us in scriptural form. That's what they would do. I'm going to prepare a place for you. In my Father's house are many mansions. I'm going to go and I'm going to prepare a place for us as a dwelling place. Jesus actually did that. During the seven-year tribulation, the raptured church will be waiting in heaven. You see, during that day, the groom would be asked, when are you going to get the bride? And the groom would say to those who asked him, only the father knows for sure, because I'm waiting for my father's permission and command, which once again, when they asked Jesus, when are you returning? He said, only my father knows. Same kinds of things and so the church is waiting. The church is waiting. And notice how it says in verse 7, Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come. His wife has made herself ready. His wife has made herself ready. So the church is waiting for the conclusion of the wedding arrangements. For us, it's a joyful celebration. It's time of fellowship. The time of waiting will lead to the marriage supper, which is what we're seeing here. Paul spoke of the church being the bride of Christ in Ephesians 5, verses 25 through 27, where he said, Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. You see, it says the wife has made herself ready. You know, one of the things we have here in the United States, and it's, it's kind of how we talk about weddings and all this, is people say, well, I've never seen a, an ugly bride. Brides prepare themselves. They get themselves ready. They're prepared. They're, 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 they're ready for, for that new life. It says in verse 8, to her, it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. And so the wife has become prepared. We'll look at that in a little detail in just a moment. But, I, I, you know, that's, that's a common saying, you know, she's beautiful. The bride was radiant. And they get the picture from here, many of many do, you know. And, and they'll say, I've never seen an ugly bride. And I was sharing with First Service how that years ago now, somebody had come and, and had gone to the front and said, could... You know, we, we have our marriage license, and the minister who is going to perform the wedding has, has backed out. And can the pastor here perform the wedding? And they didn't go to our church, and I was here. And so they came and asked, and 
everything seemed to be okay. So I went out and I said, sure. And she was wearing her dress with a little veil and everything. So I thought, oh, okay. So we come and we stand and, and the guy, you know, I'm doing the wedding and everything. And at a certain point, he, before he lifted her veil and kissed her and all, he, he says, by the way, what do I owe you? That's an awkward thing. I mean, you know, so it's, uh, oh, whatever you think she's worth. <laughs> it's awkward. So he gave me a dollar. And then he lifted her veil, and I gave him 50 cents back. <laughs> just kidding. Just, just a little levity. I don't know why I think of that. I just do. I just do. It's so serious. So we'll break it up a bit, shall we? <laughs> anyway, let's get back. Um, verse 7 says, the wife has made herself ready. Now, she'd been made ready by Jesus because he washed his bride by his blood and his word. But she made herself ready by walking in the grace and power of God. In Colossians 1.29, Paul said, I labor striving according to his power, which mightily works within me. So that's something we do, by the way. We, we want to be ready voluntarily. We don't take the grace of God for granted. We don't extend it to cover over sins that we love to continue in and go to heaven. That's not how it works. When we got saved, the grace of God was given to us in order for us not to continue practicing in sin, but to be set free from its power and its domination. And there are those who, who seem to have forgotten this, and so let me repeat it, that the grace of God is not given to me to give me permission to continue doing the things that Christ saved me out of. I don't want to be the pig who goes back to the, to the, to the mud. I don't want to be the dog who returns to the vomit. I want to be ready. I am made ready by the power of the Holy Spirit, obedience to the Word of God. I've been cleansed by the blood of Christ, and, and also the, the Word of God has washed me, and that's how it works. And, and so she has fine linen, bright and clean. That speaks of purity and beauty. It speaks of radiance. She's holy. She's without blemish. And that's how the church is, is described. In verse 9, then he said to me, write, blessed are those who are are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. He said to me, these are the true sayings of God. I fell at his feet to worship him. He said to me, see that you do not do that. I'm your fellow servant and of your brethren who have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. And so the church is ready. Notice how it says in verse 9, Blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper. Now, notice the, the, the wife, the church, is distinguished from the invited guests. Brides are not invited to their own weddings. The great multitude represents the tribulation saints and Old Testament believers. And then he says in verse 9, these are the true saints of God, which means, and we'll close with a couple of thoughts about that. You can take him at his word. Listen, John is exiled on an island called Patmos. And to see all that he has seen, such an overwhelming future must have been beyond him. The church of his day was under attack. He's exiled. The thought of triumph, the thought of the church actually being victorious, worshiping, that would have been difficult. But in the midst of everything he's experiencing, he's told, trust and hold on to God. And that's what we're supposed to do in the midst of the things that we go through. We're supposed to trust and hold on to God. Faith, if I see something in front of me, isn't really faith. That's an evidence that is there. Faith is, is trusting even when I don't see. It's holding fast, knowing that God would not lie. God is true. He is not a man that he should lie, neither is he the son of man that he should change his mind. Has he said it? Shall he not do it? 
He spoke to a man named Abram, and he said to him, you're going to have babies. You're going to have so many. If you could count the grains of sand or the stars in the heavens, that's how many descendants you shall have. And he's speaking to a man who was as good as dead, and he was an old, old man. His wife was 90 years old. Shall I have pleasure in my old age, she says within herself. I'll have a baby. God says, oh, no. You don't trust in your own ability. You trust in mine. And that's what the church needs to be reminded of, guys. When the world is shouting with a megaphone of, of bad news to all of us, don't go outside, don't hang around with friends. All of the things we hear that has been going on 24-7, even the church gets to the point where they start believing that. You know, my, my, my God is able. My God is with me. My God has not left me. My God is preparing me. My God is, my God is strong. I worship a strong God, not, not a weak God, not a God made with men's hands. I worship the God of the universe, the creator of all things. And because I do, I'll trust in him. And so he, this is a bit beyond him. And, and he goes, oh, this is amazing. This is... But trust, he says, trust in the Lord. That's what he's saying. These are the true saints of God. And so when he hears this, this is overwhelmed. Verse 10, I fell at his feet to worship. And he said, see that you don't do that. I'm your fellow servant and of your brethren who have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. This is the testimony of Jesus. The testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. The central message of the Old Testament and the New Testament is Messiah. For us to receive God's affirmation of our ministry, our life, Jesus stays in the center. No cause, no temporary condition, no current concern should ever eclipse the gospel message. Jesus must remain front and center of all things. And the fact that God will judge evil and welcome his children into his kingdom blesses us. In Philippians 3.20, our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. We eagerly wait. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. Come quickly. Not so that we can escape, but so that we may see you. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. And may I be ready. May I, may I walk in your spirit and, and, and may I love you, and, and may I bring others to know you, Lord. But come quickly. Lord, because it's not that we want to run away from what life is. It's that we want to run into your arms, and we want to be with you. But until that moment, may we do the work of ministry. May we tell people of the love of God. May we encourage people to be separate and to follow him to live lives that are holy. May we hunger for his word. May we walk in his spirit. May we love one another. And may we serve him as his servants until the time comes when he says, come up here. And then at that moment, we'll be able to look at him and see him face to face. And we'll be able to look into the eyes of the one who cried for us in that garden. And we'll be able to see the one who is the lamb of God who took away the sin of the world, the one who was slain like a lamb. And we get to see him and we get to say to him, Jesus, we love you. Thank you for what you did for me. Thank you for what you did for me. And with a, with a celebration of, of friends and family and that time's not that far from now, guys. It's not that far. Do not grow weary in well-doing, for in due time you shall reap if you faint not, Paul said. Hold fast, hold fast. Jesus is coming soon. Father, we ask that you would work in us. And Lord, we would keep our eyes centered on you. We are not to worship angels. We're not to worship men. We worship only you. And John was so overcome by what he had seen, for a moment he lapsed. And the angel had to say, you don't worship me, you worship Christ. Well, let us remember that, Lord, and may we hold fast to you. And even as our eyes are closed, our heads are bowed, there may be some right now who need to get right with the Lord. Perhaps you're watching on, online, one of the overflows or in this room right now. 
And you know the Spirit is saying it's time to get right with the Lord. As our eyes close, our heads are bowed. If you need to get right with him, I want to pray for you. Would you raise your hand and let me pray for you right where you're at? Just raise your hand that I might see you. Father, you see these hands that are going up in this place. In Jesus' name, I ask that you would reach down and touch each whose hand is raised. Father, you know exactly what the prayer of their heart is and the need that they have. We simply just ask that you would know them and meet these needs, Lord, for you're able. I ask that if it's a matter of sin and needing to be right with you, that you would wash and cleanse them as they say, say to you, God, be merciful to me, I am a sinner. And may your spirit flow and work in their life from this moment on. We yield to you, Lord, and we trust you, and we will follow you, and we thank you. Bless you, Lord Jesus. You can put your, your hands down. And Lord, keep working in us, we pray. All of us, in Jesus' name. Amen.